So welcome everyone to uh, the WealthAbility Town Hall. My name is Tom Wheelwright. I'm the host, founder, and CEO of WealthAbility. Uh, glad to have you here on Zoom and glad to have those of you who are on Facebook. Thank you so much for joining us. This is our overflow crowd and we love that we have overflow. This is awesome. So thank you so much for joining us. This is a very, um, it's a very important time right now that's going on. And uh, remembering that taxes is uh, really the way the government controls the economy. It's the way the government, it's the, it's the, the way government incentivizes us. There's uh, taxes are a major, major, major part of our life. And I think they're a lot bigger part of our life than most people think they are. Okay, so I, I'm going to start with a little bit of that. Um, but first, just for those of you who don't know me, um, just so you know a little bit of my background, I grew up in Salt Lake City, Utah. I spent two years as a Mormon missionary in Paris, learning how to be rejected, seriously, and a great experience. And uh, I just absolutely fell in love with the French people and, uh, and, and miss not being able to go over there. And um, then I spent a couple of years at the University of Utah to get my undergraduate in accounting. I uh, went to uh, the University of Texas to get my master's, of degree, master's degree in tax. I spent seven years with Ernst & Young, including three years in their national tax office in Washington, D.C. Spent four years as the in-house tax advisor for a Fortune 1000 company here in Arizona. Um, 14 years as an adjunct professor in the master's of tax program at Arizona State University. And the last 25 years plus uh, building CPA firms and serving clients. Uh, most recent 10 to 15 years, I've spent a lot of time on the road with Mr. Robert Kiyosaki of, um, let me just hold this up, Rich Dad, Poor Dad fame. Uh, uh, terrific book. Anybody who hasn't read this, definitely needs to read this. And of course, um, he, he was really a, an instigator of this book, Tax-Free Wealth, which has, um, I think, changed a lot of people's minds about how the tax law works. So I'm very grateful uh, to him, very grateful for the opportunity. I've had to travel around the world with him talking about taxes. And um, one of the things that I've discovered over the years, and I've literally been a tax professional now for 40 years. And what I've discovered over the years is that the tax law, and a lot of you have heard this from him before, is, is nothing more or less than a series of incentives. And it's incentives for whatever the government wants done at the time and going forward, right, until they change it. So, for example, uh, some of you um, own your own home and you have taken advantage, I'm sure, of the tax incentive for deducting interest expense on your home. People who rent don't get the same advantage. So that is an incentive to own a home, just as an example. Okay, there are credits, solar credits, adoption credits. Um, there are fam there's, there's social engineering going on, uh, encouraging people to go to school. We're gonna see one of those tonight. Um, I'm gonna talk about one of those uh, tonight that's uh, a social incentive when it comes to education. There are, um, there are other social programs and really a lot of this bill that we're gonna talk about is um, social. It, it very much is social. It's some, some, of, some of its economy, but a lot of it is social. And uh, I mean, for example, extending the unemployment benefits, that's as much social. Uh, certainly, I think probably more social than economics. Uh, it's not for the economy to thrive. It's for, you know, individuals to be able to pay their bills. So um, that's obviously an important part of this bill was the extension of the unemployment through um, September 6th. Uh, the additional unemployment of $300 a week. I think that was a very important part of that bill, uh, of this bill. And then of course the payments out to uh, families uh, that make less than $80,000 a, a year as a individual or less than $160,000 a year as a, a married couple. I think that also is as much social as economics um, just because the, um, we've had the, we have the highest savings rate um, that we've had in many, many, many years. And we've just been through the biggest crisis we've been through in many, 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 uh, certainly in my lifetime. So even though 
we have the highest savings rates, we're still sending people money, which tells me it's not, it's less about the economy than it is about social, uh, social payments. So um, that's how the tax law works. So what we're seeing in this bill is certain incentives that you'll see are quite different from the incentives in the CARES Act, which was enacted uh, just, uh, just, uh, under, just about a year ago, okay? Just under a year ago. And the CARES Act was very much uh, driven a lot towards employment and keep, keeping people employed. And this bill is driven much about um, social payments, okay? Payments for uh, children, payments for individuals, payments for unemployed, payments for uh, pension plans. Um, so this is a, there's a lot of social, um, social payments, social incentives in this bill, um, as opposed to some of the, pre the, the previous CARES Act, where it was a lot of business and employment economic incentives. Um, so that's a very important thing to remember uh, about the law as you, as you go looking at this is, okay, where are the incentives? Remember, one, one of the biggest misconceptions, and I was at the Arizona legislature today, um, tracking a very important bill for small businesses in Arizona, uh, Senate Bill 1783, which I'm highly in favor of, by the way, um, if you're in Arizona, um, really important bill for small businesses not to have their taxes increased um, by 80% more than a big business. Okay, so it's a, it's a, it's a parity issue for small business versus big business. But when I'm down there, what was very clear to me is that there were certain members of the legislature that clearly understood um, how the tax law works. And there's other, others that didn't understand at all, okay? And there are plenty of people that don't understand that we're talking about incentives here and we're always talking about incentives, okay? Not sometimes we're talking about incentives. We are always talking about incentives. And I just wanna be really clear. That's of course what tax-free wealth is all about is actually discussing how the different incentives work and who gets the incentives. And so when you think about that, you know, there's, there's been a lot of um, discussion in the media this past week about um, income disparity and the rich don't pay enough taxes and the rich are avoiding taxes. And there's, a, there's this whole um, PR campaign going on about we need to tax the rich more, which is, I think, going to set us up for um, potential tax increase towards the end of the year. We'll talk about that later. Uh, but what, what we have to keep in mind is that no matter what they do at the legislature, it's always going to be incentives. And if we take advantage of those incentives, we are not bad people. Okay, take, using the incentives is doing what the government wants to be done. So for example, PPP loans, um, we had a second round come out. Now you had to have a decrease in one quarter of 2020 versus 2019 to get the PPP loans. That was from the, 20, that was from the December um, stimulus package. Those new PPP loans. I, I heard people say, well, God, I don't know, I don't really need it. I'm going, well, but wait a minute. This is the government telling you to do this. So on the one hand, we see, and I, I was reading this um, um, study about tax cheats, basically. And really where um, most of the cheating comes in is in the 90%, between 90, the, the top 90 to 95 percenters. Okay, it's really not the top 1%. It's not what you would think. I mean, you would think, well, the 1%, they're gonna cheat. The 1% doesn't need to cheat. They have professional tax advisors um, like myself and, and our, uh, our Wealth Ability Network members. It, is the, it, it, is, it, it seems to be this middle group. And if you look at the study, that's what it shows. That's not what was reported, but that's what the study shows. And what we have to understand is that you don't have to cheat. Okay, there's absolutely no reason to cheat. Nothing we ever talk about at Wealth Ability will be anything that's other than legal, ethical, and moral. Okay, we are right down the middle. We just understand the law better and we explain the law better. So once you understand that, I, I wanna take the guilt and the shaming off of everybody that's on this call, okay? If you have an opportunity for one of these payments that we're talking about tonight, please don't 
don't turn this down. You're going to pay for it one way or another. And it's not greedy. Okay. It is what the government wants you to do. If the government didn't want you to do it, they wouldn't give you the opportunity to do it. That is the way it works. Okay. So you, you can always turn anything down. You can, you don't have to take your tax deductions, right? I just don't know anybody who doesn't take all their tax deductions while they're complaining about other payments. So I, I'm just saying, okay, these are opportunities to take, to, um, th there are opportunities here. And as long as you follow the law, you are doing what the government wants done. So with that, let's, let's turn to um, this new bill and let's talk about some of the key provisions in the bill. And I'm just gonna walk through them one at a time and we'll get through all, we'll get through all the major ones. There's a lot of stuff in there. I mean, <laughs> we're not gonna spend a lot of time on like federal employees getting 16 weeks off for COVID. Um, that's in that bill, uh, like um, uh, the pension plans being shored up. Um, that's in that bill, uh, like the state tax payments. That's in that bill. I want to talk about the stuff that applies to the average person. So there are some very important numbers. The first number, of course, is three hundred dollars. That's three hundred dollars per week, and that's the unemployment, and that is continuing through September sixth. That's it except that there's one other aspect of the unemployment. And that is that up to $10,200 of unemployment is now non-taxable so long as your income is under $75,000 as, as a single person or $150,000 as married. If it goes $1 over, all of this is taxable. So if you make, this is, we don't normally see cliffs in the tax law. If you make $150,000 and $1, you don't get this tax benefit. If you make, make $149,999, uh, you get all of this tax benefit. It's a cliff. So <laughs> this is, that's a number where you, if you're close, you want to make sure that you get your taxable income below your adjusted gross income, below 150,000 joint, 75,000 single. That we want to be very clear on. The second number, which we're all very familiar with by now, because most people have actually received this money already, and that is $1,400 per person. including dependents. $1,400 per person, including dependents. That also has a 75,150. This is a 75,000, 150,000 limit, okay? If you make more than that, you lose it very quickly. Uh, those payments, most of them have already gone out. Um, I know uh, people who, um, most people I know who qualify for this have already received their payment. Now, there's a little bit of a trick here. So what they're looking at to determine the $1,400 is your most recently filed tax return. So if you, if you haven't filed 2020 yet, they're looking at 2019. Well, it's okay. Let's say that you qualify in 2020, but not 2019. So they haven't sent you a check. Well, when you file your 2020 tax return, you can claim the credit. So you don't lose anything. Let's say though, that you qualified for 2019, but not 2020. Wait till you get the money, then file your 2020 tax return. And the reason is, is because you don't have to give the money back. So if, if they send it to you based on 2019 and your 2020 income happens to be twice as much, you still get to keep the money. Okay, so I'm just telling you, this is the way it works. So if, you, if your 2020 income is higher than 2019, make sure you wait to file your 2020 tax return. You have till May 17th now, even without extensions. Wait till you, file, wait till you get the money before you file your tax return, okay? That's the 1400 and that includes dependents, okay? Um, so uh, that's a very important provision. Another one, 
is this number. This is the new child tax credit. This one is for 2021. So this is 2020 tax credit. This is a 2021 tax credit, okay? So <clears throat> this credit is for the 2021 year. So obviously you're not finding your 2021 tax return until next year, right? We always file um, the following year. So how are you, why, why would they think about doing this now? Well, good question. Still, what they're gonna do is they're gonna start doing advance payments of $250 a month beginning the summer. So you'll, if you qualify for this, this is $3,000 per child under 18, an, an, an extra $600 per child if they're under age six, okay? Now they have to be under age six at the end of this year. They have to be under age six at the end of this year. So if you have a son or daughter who turns six this year, you won't get the extra $600, okay? The $3,000, you'll get the 3,000, but you won't get the extra 600 to 3,600. So any children that are under six at the end of 2021 gets $3,600, $3,000 per child. Now, this one has a very, um, this one has similar phase outs, okay? Um, 75, 150,000, okay, similar phase outs. Um, <clears throat> but they get complicated because, um, this is where this gets complicated. And if you have this question, I'm sorry, it's really complicated. I have a tough time explaining it. Let's say that you alternate dependents every year with your former spouse. You took the dependents in 2020. They're gonna make these advance payments based on your 2020 tax return. So you'll get that advance payment. However, remember, it's a 2021 tax credit. You don't get it. So you're going to have to pay it back when you file your tax return. Your spouse, who gets it in 2021, who has the dependents in 2021, they'll get it on their tax return in 2021. So they'll actually get it. You'll have to, you'll get You'll get the advance payments and have to pay them back unless you're, you make very little money, okay? So this is a little tricky for people who are divorced um, or, or not married, um, have shared arrangements. This gets really tricky and you're gonna have to sit down with the tax advisor to walk through it. I, I, I'm, not, I, I'm not going to be able to answer all your questions on this one um, for sure during this presentation. I, and I apologize for that. It's just really complicated. Um, and part of the complication comes from, um, we had a child tax credit, that's previous law, and that's treated differently than the new child tax credit, which I'm sorry, is that um, 100, sorry, yes, than the new child tax credit. We have another credit, which is, Also complicated, which is the, this is the dependent care credit. And those of you who have children know that you get a credit for preschool, dependent care, um, so that you can go to work, right? Those, that expense that you have, you get a credit for that. And historically, it's been 20% of $3,000 per child. So that amounts to a total of $600 per child, right? 20% of $3,000 per child. It's now 50% of 8,000 per child up to two children. So you could get a total of $8,000 in credit. That's dollar for dollar and refundable. Okay, so you could get that much money back. That phase out, it's 
starts at under 25,000 for part of it. And then it phases out again at 400,000. Okay, so <laughs> let's just see how complicated we can make the math. Okay, my head is spinning. I've been looking at this for weeks, you know, last couple of weeks. My head's still spinning. I still don't get it all. And I, I'm going to tell you that there may be a couple of things I have to do a little look up while we're on the call. And I, I hope you'll be patient with me and allow me to do that because I do want to answer your questions. It's just that I may have to, I've got it on my screen. I've got the bill on my screen and I get these confused sometimes. Um, remember, this is our third bill in less than a year, third. And it's of course hundreds of pages long and uh, I, I don't wanna make an excuse, just wanna tell you, I may need a little patience here if I have to look something up. Um, these are the big ones. Now, there's a couple of other things that I'd like to mention though. One is, um, there's a, there's a, a nice COBRA provision, okay? Uh, a COBRA extension that's, you know, if you're, un, you're you, you go unemployed, um, other than for gross, you know, gross negligence or whatever, but you know, you're just unemployed because of whatever. And um, you get to keep your insurance, right? That's COBRA. And there's some payment of it um, through September. And then um, you've, got, you've got some pretty good time on that. I'm not gonna go through that in detail, partially because I don't, I haven't learned it all, um, but partially because it's, that's one of those things that only applies to somebody in that situation. Um, there's, uh, uh, there, are, there are some nice benefits, like I said, to the state, et cetera. One of the interesting provisions is that student loan forgiveness is going to be non-taxable. Now, the reason that's odd is that student loans aren't forgiven. So what we expect is we expect an executive order from President Biden for giving student loans, at least to some degree, okay? Because this is setting up to be non-taxable. Now, let me tell you some other, there's some other really nice important tax provisions um, and a couple of other provisions. First of all, some of you received an EIDL grant. I'm gonna write that over here. And this was up to, $10,000. This is a $10,000 grant. It was $1,000 per employee up to $10,000. Originally, that was supposed to be paid back if you got a PPP loan. If you got a PPP loan that was forgiven, you were supposed to pay this back. They have now forgiven this. So you do not have to pay this back. So when you're doing your PPP loan application, don't take this into account, okay? Your forgiveness application. Don't take this into account. Um, second of all, the expenses related to this are also are deductible. Just like on the PPP loan, right, from December, now the expenses are deductible. The same is true with the EIDL grant. So as a general rule, if it's non-taxable under one of these uh, relief provisions, the expenses are still going to be deductible. You're not going, they, they've been really generous on that in making clear that all of these payments, like there's restaurant payments and some, uh, you know, um, special events pay, uh, payments for people who have special events uh, venues, those payments that are non-taxable, those are, the expenses are still deductible. So they made it very clear to the IRS, don't come after people for deducting their expenses. It, it's great because it's, it's a windfall, obviously. You get the PPP loan, and you get to deduct your expenses. One other um, provision in here is this also extends through the end of the year, the employee retention credit. The employee retention credit is up to $7,000 per quarter per employee. So up to $28,000 per year per employee. Now you have to have, you know, your, this quarter compared to 2019 has to be down by 20% for you to get the employee retention credit. And you can get the employee retention credit because we have 24 weeks of PPP forgiveness and you probably only need to use say 12 weeks. You can use the rest of the weeks for the um, employee retention credit. 
So you technically can get both PPP loan forgiveness and employee retention credit. Those of you who have not applied for the employee retention credit, please, please, please talk to your tax advisor and run through the numbers. You may be surprised. You may have had a good year last year, but one quarter was bad. You had one bad quarter. It might've been the last quarter of the year, might've been the first quarter of the year, might've been the second quarter of the year. Most people were a little easier in the third quarter, but it could have been just one quarter. You're still going to qualify, okay, with that one quarter for a second PPP loan. And if that quarter were the end of, let's say the fourth quarter, um, the way that it, it works is you can, you can look at the fourth quarter instead of having to look in Jan at the first quarter of 2021, you can actually go backwards and use the third, fourth quarter of 2020 Look at that compared to fourth quarter of 2019. And if you're down 20%, you get the employee retention credit for that. So again, you get both, okay? You, you, you have to work with your accountant, but you can get both the PPP loan and a forgiveness as well as the employee retention credit. So please, uh, I, I don't think the employee retention credit has gotten a big, a, a lot of press in part because when it first came out, um, you couldn't get both. You know, it was either employee retention credit or PPP. But what they changed now is that you can get both. Okay. So, and employee retention credit goes through the end of 2021. And by the way, you can be a brand new business in 2020 and still get it. So employee retention credit, that would be the other, I think, to think about and don't forget the second PPP. Now that's not part of this bill, second PPP, that was part of the December bill, but the, it's still available. So if you haven't taken advantage of it, you may very well, may want to do, might, you very well might wanna do that and definitely take uh, advantage of the employee retention credit. Um, all right, Manny, so I've gone, um, long enough right now. This is basically kind of the essence of this bill. This is the essence. So I know I went fast. I know there was a lot. Um, so um, please ask questions. If you have questions, raise your hand. Uh, I tend to take um, people who raise their hands before I take typed in questions, uh, just because I like to hear, I like to have a conversation with you. And um, so go ahead and raise your hand if you have a question about any of these um, and, and just know that I might have to do a little looking up. I've got it on my screen here and I might do a little, uh, little research here and we'll, we'll find it, okay? I've been through the bill several times, but I may still have to find it, okay? Just so in, in case I get confused. All right, so with that, Manny, let's go ahead and take the first question. Excellent. So we have a question from PJ and it's on topic with what you were saying. The question is, as a self-employed sole proprietor, I was approved for the PPP loan. What can I use this money for? And are there any defined restrictions if I'm audited? Uh, yeah. So um, thank you for asking that question. You can use it for, I mean, it's a pretty broad range of what you can use it for. Uh, you can use it for salary which it, you're so employed. So it's your salary, right? It's up to $10,000 a month. So you can use it actually for, to replace your salary. Um, you can use it for utilities. You can use it for mortgage. You can use it for rent. Um, I believe there are a couple of other things you can still use it for um, that are even beyond that. Uh, but there's, a, it's almost impossible not to be able to use it all. Remember, you got a PPP loan based on two and a half months of your income, but you have 24 weeks of expenses to use it. So 24 weeks, that's almost six months, right? So you only got two and a half months of wages and you have six months and you get to include um, utilities, rent, um, mortgage, not mortgage on your business, not mortgage on your house. Um, but if you have rent for your house, if you have rent for your business, um, if you have utilities for your business, 
And um, interesting question. I would presume if you're self-employed that and your office is your home, that would include your home office. Okay, so include utilities for your home office, it include rent, um, it include mortgage related to your home office. I have not looked that up, but I have got to presume that that would be the case. Now, the reality is, is that if your loan is under 150,000, you are not gonna be audited, period. You're just not going to. They're, 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 they are not going to audit under, under 150,000. I don't believe. Uh, unless they change something, they're not going to. So you're just kind of certifying. You should be good. Um, if you're over 150,000, you could be audited. If you're over 2 million, you absolutely will be audited. Okay, they're going to audit everybody over 2 million. I have clients already that are getting audits. So, um, I, I will say also, though, that my experience is that if you use it for salary, for wages, because that's easier to prove, um, it, it, and, and that's what you use it for, that's the least chance, the, the least likelihood of being audited. And the least, if you, you can choose, by the way, to just use salary. Now, salary has to be 60% of your use right? A minimum of 60%. If it's less than that, you, you lose it. So it has to be a minimum of 60%. Well, you lose it. You have to get to, you get forgiven up, up to 60%. That's what you get of your uh, um, salary has to be 60% of the amount that's forgiven. So you can't get be forgiven for um, more than that. Um, so what that means is, is that um, if, if I were applying for forgiveness, then and I could just use salary. I would just use salary, okay? Assuming I don't have employee retention credit um, that, um, and, and that I don't have that issue, I would probably just use salary um, just because I think your chance of being audited are less and it's easy one for them to verify. Um, and, you know, but if you're under 150,000, you really just have to stipulate that you did what you were supposed to do. And I, it doesn't appear that those are gonna get any kind of serious audits anymore. The uh, early ones did, but it doesn't look like that's going to be the case anymore. Who's next, uh, Manny? We have a live question from Miguel. Uh, Miguel, you're allowed to talk, so please make sure that you unmute yourself and Miguel. You ask a question. Hey, can you hear me? I can. How are you? I'm doing great. Hope you are. Thank Appreciate you. Appreciate what you're doing here. I've got an adult um, son disabled that's getting a disability check. Is there any kind of additional credits um, available with that? It, uh, it, is your adult son a dependent of yours or not? Um, we have kind of gone back and forth. We we took him off so he can get um, so he can get the stimulus check. Okay, so if he's not a dependent, he gets the stimulus check. That's that's what he gets. Okay. okay. Um, if he is a dependent, then you get the stimulus check. So it's just who gets it. That's uh, all it is. So that, that's all right? I need. But, but the stimulus check is really the big one when you're talking about an adult um, dependent, somebody gotcha. who is an adult. Um, I similarly have, have a son that has uh, some uh, challenges and he, he got the $1,400 check. Okay. Thank you. Thank okay. you, Miguel. Who's next, Manny? Okay, we have another question. This uh, one is live as well from Luan. Uh, Luan Dang, uh, please unmute yourself. Hello, Luan? Luan? Luan. I see you unmuted. Okay. Then let's get a question from Tom. Uh, oh, he's saying he's asking for one second. Luan Dong. Oh, okay. Are you there, Delon? Well, we'll come back to you, Delon. Okay, where are you shot? Uh, this question is from Tom, and he says, you stated that the unemployment benefits part of the bill is not really economic, but rather social, as it is about helping everyone pay their bills. Isn't it really also economic, though, uh, in that if folks can pay their bills, the providers of goods and services that don't get paid suffer revenue revenue deficits? Yeah, there's there's no question. I mean, I, I get what you're saying. And so, uh, yeah, I mean, you, you, I, I don't think that's the, I'm looking at the, there's always a purpose behind an incentive. 
And, and the purpose on the unemployment really is to take care of the unemployed. That is the purpose. And I think it's, a, I personally, I'm in favor, okay? I, I think it's a laudable purpose um, because if you're unemployed, you have a hardship and you can't necessarily get reemployed because still we have a lot of uh, shutdowns going on. So I, I just think that's the primary impetus for it. Does it have an economic impact? Absolutely. All money that goes out has an economic impact. So um, totally has an economic impact. You're 100% right. I just think that's the reason for it. Um, and that's the argument for it. And I, I, and I, I, don't, I, I don't disagree with the argument. I, I think that people who are unemployed, they, they're, they're struggling. My, my son is unemployed. So I, I, and he's independent, okay? He's independent of me. He doesn't rely on me. So he, he, you know, I know that it's a struggle. So absolutely. Um, so absolutely, does it, um, what we find is a lot of these payments, they do more than one thing, okay? In this case, it's maybe number one, it's going to help the unemployed um, put food on the table. And number two, of course, when they put food on the table, it obviously affects whoever they buy the food from. So thanks for making that clarification. Who's next? Uh, sure, we have a live question from Jing. Hey, Jing. Jing. Make sure you yourself. Jing. Hey, Tom. Thank there you so go. much uh, for the prize yesterday. Uh, it was really oh, cool. you're welcome, Jing. That was awesome. You. So uh, two questions I have. The first one is, is I'm a uh, sole proprietor and I got the PPP loan the first round. I yep. wanted to know if the salary or owner compensation is taxable. And number two is regarding the EIDL loan. I read that the, the, the payment got deferred for another year. And I wanted to know if you happen to understand if the accrual interest is gonna to accumulate till next year or is it still gonna be the same payment amount as the loan originally stated? Yeah, so, so first of all, the wages are taxable. Okay, so that's an easy one. Um, uh, second of all, uh, my understanding, and I'm, uh, you know, I have to look to be absolutely sure, but my understanding is that interest is still accruing. So while they may keep, while they may just extend the loan, that interest, to my knowledge, is still accruing. I actually paid off my EI deal loans for that reason, is that we recovered. Um, and I felt like we didn't need that reserve anymore. So I paid them back with, with the interest. They did charge me all of the interest. Okay, I'm gonna be really clear. <laughs> I paid off the principal and then they came back and said, well, you also owe X number of thousands of dollars for interest. And so I, by the way, if you're gonna pay it off, call them, call the SBA because they'll give you a payoff number right there and they'll give you a payoff for the next um, and they'll tell you how much the daily rate is for the next few days. Um, but you can give them a, you can actually give them a debit card over the phone. So uh, it, it's just practical stuff for paying off your EIDL loan. This is different, by the way, for everybody. It's different from the EIDL grant, okay? This is a grant. This is not a loan. There was also a up to $150,000 loan, okay? That loan, yes, the payment's been deferred, but my understanding and my experience is the interest is still accruing. Thanks for those questions, Jing. Who's, who's next, Manny? We're gonna try Luan again, Luan. Luan. Hi, uh, Tom, can yes. you hear me now? Yes, we oh, can. Oh, finally. Yeah, of course I know you through uh, Robert and I'm sure you heard of Mike Diller, right? So I'm- Mike uh, is a very good friend of mine. I love yes. Mike Diller. Thank you. Yes, very, very good entrepreneur. I have a quick question. I'm, I'm W2 employee and um, I asked my CVA last time and they said that I'm not qualified for, because I have a home, home based business and I asked uh, the CVA to see if I'm qualified for PP loan. And they, and the CVA said no. So uh, am I might qualify for that as well or that's you, complicated. Do you make money on your, in your business? Um, yes, but I, I file as a loss. Okay, so if you have a loss, you don't because they're looking at net income. They, they do. I see. Okay. So that that's why they told you that because you're you're showing a loss. So there's no um, there's no net income. Now there was a change. Um, let's see if I can find that real quick. Um, I don't think it's in this bill. 
There was a change, and uh, I, I'd have to look at it. Um, one, if um, Manny, if you make a note, if um, I'll look this up for Luan, and we'll get sure, back to Luan. Um, there was a change in the uh, December bill on PPP loans, and I thought it changed the sole proprietors to a gross income calculation um, for the PPP loan. So I have to look at that. Um, I don't have a lot of clients in that situation, but uh, let me let me take a look because I'm I, I remember seeing something to that effect. So the original PPP loan, the answer would be no. Okay, so the first PPP loan, it was clearly no. You, it was net income. My recollection though is the second PPP loan. If you qualify for the second PPP loan, remember if the second PPP loan, you had to have a quarter that was 25% less than um, in 2020 than the same quarter in 2019. So if you qualify for the P second PPP loan, my recollection is that you, you, you get a PPP loan based on your gross, um, the gross income amount, not the net income amount. But I will double check that for you, Luan. I, I will actually sure, just- thank you. I just don't have that up in front of me right now um, since it was the December bill and I was focused on the on the most re more recent bill. Thanks for asking that. I do think that, I, I, I do recall though, that there was a change there. Okay, I took a note. Uh, next, we're gonna have David. Uh, David, you can unmute yourself. David. Hey, how are you, Tom? Good, how are you, David? I, uh, great speech. I heard you at uh, Brass Summer Arts event. Oh, thank you. Loved it. Thank you, thank you. And right, right after the event, I bought the book, book and, uh, Came to a town hall. Awesome, thank you. Um, and all, I was, I'm already uh, half through the book. Um, great, great, great ideas are there. And my question is, in 2020, there was a lot of like PPP or any other, because I'm a real estate investor, I'm a full-time investor, uh, in real estate investor, but I don't, is there any tax um, incentive or stimulus for landlords who's losing like, um, rent income? So there were a couple of provisions um, and you're, now you are taxing my memory here, but there were a couple of provisions. One was there was a provision to provide rental assistance, okay? And um, you could help your tenants get that assistance and then they could just, and, and it could be paid directly to you. So that was one place where they gave benefit. The other was is that there, um, there were certain uh, landlord loans where the SBA paid, made some of the payments. Um, I, I know that also, um, I have seen that actually. So those were the two, I think the two major issues. And of course they, they did defer loans. Um, uh, they did, did defer payments on mortgages as well for landlords. So those would be the big things. Um, you, unless you have employees, you wouldn't have qualified for all the employment, the PPP and so forth. Those right. were specific to um, uh, employment. Um, but the, those were the things that I recall being um, the major incentives for real estate. The, the, the tenant assistance was significant. And I had many clients who used um, the tenant assistance to help people. And then the, um, I had, I've seen other clients where they've had, they had the SBA actually paid um, their mortgage for some of the year on some of their um, properties. So um, I don't know what, the, what, what you have available to go back to retroactively, or if you had to do it in 2020. Um, but that is something that if I were you, I would definitely be looking at and maybe just talk to uh, your tax advisor about that. Excellent. Next up, we have Jorge. Hi, Jorge. Just to mute yourself. Jorge. Jorge. Jorge once. Hello. Oh, yes, yeah. there he is. Good afternoon, Mr. Wheeler. How are you? Doing great. Listen, thanks for everything last night. That was a great, definitely a, a great live session last night. Got a oh. lot of notes. 
Listen, I have two questions for you. Kind of piggyback out of the, the last two calls. I also have a W-2 and I also have a few rentals. But like for like the last 10 months, like three of them have not paid me a cent. Um, I don't know if I should go and ask about, you know, these PPP loans, if I can, you know, apply for one, will I have to repay them? And the second question I have is, I had a baby January of 2020, and I'm having another one in October 2021. And I did not understand the whole 2021 credit stuff. Okay. Would you mind I clarifying that? I can clarify that. You will like this. So on uh, first of all, you don't, in, unless you have employees, you don't qualify for the PPP loan. What you could have done, by the way, um, it, I, I, I'm pretty sure that this program's closed. You could have gotten an EIDL loan um, last year. That, that was the loan that we were talking about earlier. Uh, you could have gotten an EIDL loan. I know this because I'm a landlord and I got an EIDL loan for my uh, rental property, okay, that I knew I was going to need, okay, because I have commercial property and nobody was renting commercial property last year. So, um, you could have done that, okay? I don't think you can go back and get that. Now, let's talk about the child credit because you actually have, uh, assuming that your income, now this is where real estate um, professionals get a lot of benefit because their income almost never goes over these limits, right? Because you've got depreciation. In your case, you've got actual cash losses um, so you may have zero income for uh, 2020. Um, so you, you may very easily meet these limits for the child tax credits. But for you, you're going to get a $3,600 credit for child number one and another $3,600 credit for child number two. So you're going to get $7,200 on top of the $1,400 payments. Okay, so you'll also get the $1,400 payment um, for the, you get the $1,400 payment for the first child, okay? Um, but you will get the full $7,200 for the two children, one to be born later, um, because that's this, because it's a 2021 credit and they are under six years of age, um, assuming that you meet the income limits, which I would assume you do. So what you would do is you're going to get Basically, what you're going to get is you're going to get $250 per month starting this summer for, this is um, child number one, right? Child number two, not born yet, but child number two, you're going to get this credit on your 2021 tax return. So when you file your 2021 tax return, you'll get this credit, and then whatever part of this credit hasn't been paid in advance, okay? So you will get it, um, assuming that you meet the income limits. Okay, so that's, that's actually the good news for you is that there's some pretty good, pretty serious money there. And on top of that, you, of course, you get your 1400 for you, 1400 for your spouse, spouse and 1400 for child number one who was born at the end of last year. So you'll get that, by the way, you'll get that one for the, the, the $1,400 for your child that was born um, in 2020. You, you probably, you may get that, you may have, gotten it already, I don't know. Um, if you already filed, uh, social, apply for a social security number for them, you do have to have a social security number for your children um, in order to get these credits. So make sure you apply for the social security number for your ch children. And, um, and then you may get the 1400 for child number one uh, right away. Or if not, you can claim it on your 2020 tax return. Okay. Awesome, thank you. Welcome. And by the way, I just I, I just want to, um, Manny, I just want to make a point here. We have a lot of people on this um, on the Zoom and Facebook that they're going, what was last night? So I want to explain what last night was, okay? Go ahead. So um, uh, those who are, and I like to refer to them uh, sometimes as members, but those who are part of the WealthAbility um, family, okay, because of uh, you, because you're involved in our courses or you're involved in a strategy or uh, what we call Roadmap Plus, you're involved in one of those programs. I do, uh, we do twice a month, 
a one hour question answer webinar with just those people who are um, part of our, fam our, our WealthAbility family. Um, and we record it and we take questions and answers and I use the whiteboard and there are any question, any question you got. So uh, if you, if you know, if you, if you'd like more information about that, just um, go to wealthability.com and schedule a call. And we're happy to talk to you about, you know, if there's a way we can help you, we will. Um, but certainly uh, I think that we call it WealthAbility Live. And I do think that's one of the best things we do. And it's one of the most valuable uh, programs we have. So thanks everybody. Um, you'll notice that everybody loves those calls. I do too. And um, Michael Eden, who's uh, on our staff, he helps me with them. He's uh, one of our tax professionals on our staff, on our WealthAbility staff. And he helps me with those. And I, I think they are tremendous, tremendous calls. We get great questions. And um, so thank you for um, everybody who's been mentioning that. I just want everybody else to know what that is. So if you're just wondering, go to, go to wealthability.com and just schedule a call and we'll see, uh, we can talk about it, okay? So who's next, Manny? Excellent. We have a question from Facebook. This was from Travis. Uh, he asked, my wife received approximately $10,400 in unemployment benefits. Uh, is the first $10,200 tax-free? I only would owe taxes on, approximate, on approximately $200, correct? That is correct. If you meet that income limit, again, it's a, it's a cliff, right? So if you meet that income limit. Now, the IRS just clarified this this week. The income limit does not include the unemployment. Okay, it does not include the unemployment. So if you meet that income limit, then the first $10,200 is non-taxable and you would only be taxed on, on you'd pay tax on the $200, which is gonna be amount to what, 20 or $50, something like that. So good job. Perfect. The next question is coming from Dennis. So Dennis, you've been unmuted. Uh, go ahead and unmute yourself and ask your question. Yes, hi, Tom. Hi, uh, Dennis. Um, my wife and I received a um, income from a, a trust and uh, the income is mostly from uh, commercial real estate and some other dividends and interest. And I hope this isn't too complicated, but um, a few years ago, the tax laws changed on the fiduciary, uh, the fiduciary fees, uh, the way it was allocated by the, uh, the trust. Or, well, anyway, it, it, it appears that um, our income has, uh, you know, the, the bank takes out quite a bit of, it's managed by a major bank, which I won't mention a name, but uh, they uh, take out a pretty hefty fee every month. And now when, when I look at uh, the net income that's reported on a K-1 for the real estate, um, it, it seems like we're paying a lot more taxes on that income and not getting the benefit of the, uh, the fees that, you know, that were taken out. And you can no longer can take those off on a Schedule A. Right. So, um, so let me let me kind of explain for everybody um, what Dennis is talking about. So, trusts, as a general rule, are taxed like individuals. It's a general rule. They're taxed like individuals. Um, it, interestingly enough, they didn't set up a separate tax law for trusts. Um, for the most part, they're taxed. They follow the individual tax law. So with the 2017 Tax Act, investment fees, administrative fees are no longer deductible, okay, um, as an itemized deduction. So uh, it's very possible you could lose and you could see a, a major tax increase. That is a result of the 2017 Tax Act. And um, that does make sense to me. That that's what would happen. Now, is there a way to uh, work with the trustee and maybe a way to deal with that? There might be, um, but I don't know. If you can't change the trustee, then you may not be able to do that because a major bank is going to have their rules and they're not going to change very easily. Um, my philosophy is <laughs> that when we ask a 
hacks question, we should always ask the question, how could I do this? So the question I would be asking the banker, the, the trustee, how could we make this deductible? This is, I'm losing the money, I'm spending the money, but I'm getting taxed on it. So how could we make it deductible? And they might not have an answer for you, um, but I will tell you, okay, I got somebody said the follow up, right? Um, I will tell you that um, if there's, you know, if you talk to your, if there's a way to change the trustee, which there may, may not be, there may be a way to deal with that, right? But this is the challenge when you have inflexible people handling affairs. Now, granted, you may have had no control over this. Um, and at the time, it wasn't an issue because it was all deductible. Now, um, I understand that this change that they've made and uh, it, it is a burden. So I would go back and I would just say, how would we do this? Um, that's always the question we wanna ask is how to do something, not can we do this? All right, so thank you for the question. I'm, I'm sorry that the answer isn't a, uh, an answer more in your favor. I, I think that is correct. Uh, my recollection is that is correct, that you probably are getting taxed on money that you didn't get. And it's, is it fair? Nope. Um, and that's the way the tax law is. Could you make it fair? Mm, depending on who the trustee is, you might be able to. Thanks for that question. Who's next? Sure, next question, we have Benjamin. Benjamin, all you need to do is unmute yourself. Benjamin. Yeah, hi, Tom, thanks. Um, I just started reading your book, Audible, and uh, I'm halfway through, it's been great. I'm awesome. glad Robert talked you into it. It's, uh, it's been worth it. So I'll have to listen to it two, two or three more times though. Um, a couple, couple things, first of all, this is just a short, you know, what's your conviction on if the government's gonna continue to rain stimulus? Also, Janet Yellen signaled potential tax increases, taxes on who, and where are the tax incentives shifting with Biden in office? Well, I'm, gonna, I'm just going to go with that one because I've been wanting to go with that one. So I'm going to go with that one for a little bit. And if you want to come back to the stimulus bill, that's fine. But I'm going to go with that Benjamin's question because I'm dying to go there. Um, okay. First of all, is there going to continue to rain stimulus money? I would say probably not. Now, there's two reasons for it. One is that, remember, the, this last bill was passed under what they call the reconciliation process. This is a very important process to understand. So I'm going to explain it in very, very simple terms. In general, for a, a bill to pass the Senate, it needs 60 votes. That's the general rule. It needs 60 votes to pass the Senate. Well, remember, there are 50 Republicans and 50 Democrats. So the Democrats don't have 60 votes. So if the Republicans say, absolutely not, then the Democrats can't pass a bill with one exception. And it's what's called reconciliation. And when you think, well, reconciliation, I'm reconciling? What am I reconciling? Well, what they're reconciling is the budget. This is basically a budget bill. And they said, look, every year, and the, remember the fiscal year for the federal government goes from October 1st to September 30th. It's not a calendar year. October 1st through September 30th. In, in a bill that all of, they say only has fiscal impacts, okay, as fiscal impacts as far as the government is concerned, um, and it relates to the government's budget, they can pass a bill with a simple majority. Well, the Democrats have a simple majority because they have 50 Democratic senators and they have the tiebreaker in um, Vice President Harris. 
So if they get 100% of their people on board, they can pass a bill under reconciliation. They only get one each fiscal year. So they've used their one through September 30th. So that's why I don't see we're gonna think we're gonna see another COVID stimulus. The, the Republicans are gonna say no. They didn't like this one. Um, they thought we didn't need it. Uh, they would have made a much smaller bill where it just did the unemployment and maybe some small tax, maybe some small payments for um, COVID relief. Um, they certainly didn't, you know, their, their proposal was 600 billion. Apparently that's a small bill now. I don't know if you remember, but 2009, 2008 and nine, um, that big package was um, my recollection, $700 billion. That was the big one, okay, TARP. This is the, the Republicans offered 600 billion, the Democrats said, no way, no way. We'll, we'll take your 600 billion, we'll triple it, we'll make it 1.9 trillion. But they passed it under reconciliation, which means they don't, they don't get another one until October. So that's why I don't think we'll see more you know, stimulus money raining down. However, there is a there is an appetite in Congress for infrastructure, and you've probably heard this in the news lately that there's a lot of discussion about infrastructure, and infrastructure includes, by the way, charging stations for electric cars. Infrastructure includes um, solar energy for the grids. That's part of infrastructure because that's part of your electric grid. So. It does include some, um, and, and it may be that some Republicans would join on that, um, on an infrastructure bill. Uh, re, you, I don't know if you remember, but infrastructure, a, a trillion dollar infrastructure bill was originally conceived and proposed by President Trump during his, uh, the, the first year in office. And it was just shot down, it never went anywhere. Um, but it was actually a Repu the Republican president who proposed it the first time. So there you could get, and, and that's why I say that's a little bit of stimulus in a way that you're talking about creating jobs and, and, and uh, you know, road projects and stuff like that, right? So it's not raining money. It's not helicopter money like this last bill where they just send everybody checks. Um, instead, this, it, this would be more of a um, projects type of a thing. Now, what does this mean for tax increase? It really means that the likely tax increase will come in December. Twenty twenty one. Remember, the government year starts again, October first. So they can pass another bill under reconciliation without any Republicans joining in in after September 30th. Okay, so they can pass one before the, now they, they don't wanna do anything in 2022. And the reason they don't wanna do anything in 2022 is it's an election year and they don't wanna do that in 2022. So they want the tax increase to be 2020. I mean, sorry, 2021. So will there be major tax increases? That all depends on a couple of moderate Democratic senators. Uh, Joe Manchin of West Virginia, Kirsten Sinema of uh, my fair state of Arizona. And there are a couple of other moderate, um, more moderate Democrats. Now, those two joined in on the stimulus bill on this $1.9 trillion bill. So who knows? They may get brought into line and be offered other things. Yeah, what we do know is uh, Joe Biden, President Biden has suggested up to $4 trillion in tax increases. Um, everything from a wealth tax is on the table to um, uh, increase to state taxes to uh, increase capital gains taxes to increase top rates. Who's it going to apply to? 
Now this is this one I'm absolutely sure of. Four hundred thousand dollars is the magic number. Curiously, the question's always been when President Biden was campaigning. Um, he was talking about nobody over four hundred thousand dollars, under four hundred thousand dollars, get taxed. However. What changed, and we saw it in this stimulus bill, the American Rescue Plan, we saw it in this bill. It was not $400,000 per person. It was $400,000 per couple. So it's $200,000. Well, if you think about $200,000 as a limit, that actually makes a lot more sense because all, a lot, of, there's a lot of money between $200,000 and $400,000, a lot of money. Because there's a lot of people make between two and four hundred thousand dollars, so there's a lot of money in the economy that's in that that range. Um, this will be the magic number if you're married. This will be the magic number four hundred thousand. If you're single, maybe two hundred. Um, I they will do everything possible because what they don't want is a repeat of George H. W. Bush, who said, "Read my lips, no new taxes," and then he enacted tax increases and lost the election directly as a result of that, read my lips. So um, people still remember that and people certainly will be reminded of that. What's going on right now is a PR campaign to raise taxes on people making more than $200,000, $400,000. Let's be clear, this is a PR campaign and it's very well orchestrated. So, uh, uh, I, I, I do expect um, the American public is very, seems to be very happy about voting tax increases on other people. That's been the experience. So um, as long as it doesn't affect them, they're happy to, have, yeah, let's, let's tax the rich. They're bad. Okay. They're bad. So uh, I'm not a fan, if you can't tell. And the reason I'm not a fan is because most of these people that they're talking about taxing the rich are entrepreneurs and uh, they didn't make their money in the stock market. You want to, you want to, you want to tax stock gains at 40%? Go for it. I, I frankly, I, I'm okay with that. I, I, I go on record. I'm okay with that. Um, you know, especially over a million dollars, something like that. But if you want to tax business gains at 40%, please don't do that. You, you want to tax businesses at this high, extra high rate, please don't do that. You're, you're gonna kill business, which kills employment. So all those incentives, you know, for employees, uh, you're gonna lose it. Um, so yes, Janet Yellen has signaled that she wants to increase taxes. Well, some of that she will do through regulation. No, also, one more thing. Uh, President Biden's top two tax policy people our professor who wrote a paper in 2019 suggesting all of these new taxes on the wealthy. Okay, his top two tax policy people, one in budget, one in treasury. So just, not, just know that, and they're professors, so they're not, you know, that they, they don't have any real world experience. Um, they just have theoretical experience. And theoretically, they're, they could be right, but, Practically, we know they're not right because people's behaviors change. So if you want, um, if you want to follow, um, besides following us, which I highly recommend, the Tax Foundation is very good also um, with a lot of statistics and a lot of data on uh, new, new tax, um, new tax bills, et cetera. So I love the Tax Foundation. Um, that's the organization, that's the think tank that I go to most. Who's next, Manny? Sure, we have a question from Scott. He says, have you heard anything from restaurants? Re, re, damn, revitalizing, I can't say that word. Re Revitalizing? Thank you, fun. Uh, the SBA has yet to issue roles on any other guidance regarding the application procedure for RRF grants. Oh, these are the new grants. Okay, so this is in the bill. I have not heard anything. Um, uh, the, these, uh, these grants are important. They're really important. Um, I was gonna see if I could find it here. Um, 
Uh, yeah, it's, it's the Restaurant Revitali Revitalization Fund, um, RRF is what it is. And uh, restaurants need it. Oh my heavens, they need it. Um, restaurants have just been hammered and extending the, the one downside to extending the $300 a week unemployment is I think restaurants are still gonna get hurt by that. Um, because if you pay somebody to not work more than um, or equal to the, what they can pay that they do work, they're gonna probably choose not to work, okay? Not always, but they will frequently choose not to work. And I know restaurants have had a really tough time finding people. Um, Um, the, sh the short answer, though, is I am, um, th there are, there is a significant grant, and I have not heard anything. Uh, um, certainly, I would be going to the SBA, and that's where I would follow it. Um, and you know what, I'll tell you what, man, if you'll just take a note, uh, my, my wife has restaurant clients. So, oh, here it is. Restaurant revitalization grants. Here's what it says. Oh, this is just a tax treatment, okay? Um, yeah, it just says, it says Treasury is supposed to, to write the rules, okay? So um, I knew I'd seen it in here. Um, they're not taxable, I know that, and the expenses are deductible. So that part I know, but how to get them, um, I'm not so familiar with um, how to get them. Let's see who else can stump me. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, let's try Orlando's question. He owns several investment properties and has had more depreciation and expenses in the past years that he was not allowed to deduct. And he believes that can be used in years following. If I have withdrawn money from my 401k through the CARES Act in 2020, can I use those accrued depreciation and expenses from the past years against the 401 income in order to lower my AGI and taxable income? The answer is maybe. So let me explain what, let me explain um, where you could. So there are two reasons you might not have been able to use it. Reason number one is that you just didn't have income. So you had a net operating loss. Okay. Now, your net operating loss, if you have a net operating loss, you can carry that back, right? If you had a net operating loss in 2020, you can carry that back five years. So that one you can carry back. You don't have to carry it forward. So you can use it and get a refund, okay? Number two is that you had, uh, they were considered passive. Now, if you had the net operating loss, this can be used, you know, if you carried it and you took that 100,000, this could absolutely be used. So this one is yes. This one is no. And the reason is because if it's a passive loss carryover, it's still passive in 2020 and your withdrawal of your 401k or your IRA is not passive. That's ordinary. So um, if, if you carried it over, because it was passive, the answer would be no. If you carried it over because um, you were, um, you did qualify and it did uh, either as a real estate professional or because your income was low enough, you got your $25,000 um, a year, right? To be able to take, that creates a net operating loss. That could be used against that, absolutely. Who's next, Manny? Sure. The next question is from Scott. He says, does your 2020 revenue have to be less than 2019 or can you use net profit? My revenue remained fairly stable, but I had much higher expenses for 2020, greatly reducing my net income. I'm not sure what the question is there. Um, if it's a net operating loss, it's, it's a, it's a, it has to be a loss. So it has to actually be more than your income. So in order to carry it back. Okay, but I wasn't quite sure if that was your question. If it's not, um, you know, if you could just um, add in the Q&A question. Okay, next question from uh, David Johnson. Hey, David, you can hey, uh, David. unmute yourself. 
David. Are you there, David? Okay, we'll see if he comes back. In the meantime, Justin asks, any thoughts on whether or not the state of Arizona will conform to the IRS treatment of PPP loan forgiveness and deductibility of expenses? Also, do you think Arizona will conform to the IRS filing deadline of May 15th? I have an update for you on that. I was at the state legislature today, the Ways and Means Committee, and they passed a bill um, in Ways and Means. So they passed it out of Ways and Means, which means it now goes to the House um, for the full, full vote that would conform the May 17th filing deadline. Okay, so that one I know that's there. I think they will pass that. Will they pass the full conformity? So the way Arizona works, some states automatically conform to federal law. Some states, like California, almost never conform to federal law. And then some states every year have to decide, are we going to conform to federal law? Arizona is the latter. And so the, they, there is a bill at the state legislature that would conform everything across the board um, to, the, uh, to, to what the um, federal law is. So that is there. Um, I, one of the bills that uh, passed out of committee today was on the net operating loss carryback. So one of the issues is, is that we have this net operating loss carryback for 2018, 19, 20 for federal, but we don't have that for Arizona. And it actually whipsaws people because if you carried it back for federal, but we don't conform in Arizona, then you actually lose the NOL carry forward because you start with federal taxable income. So um, Arizona doesn't have its own NOL. In other words, it's a federal NOL. And if you use the federal NOL and we don't conform, then, you'll, then we lose it completely. We lose that net operating loss. Okay, so um, I believe they will conform. I, I do. Uh, we have a Republican legislature, both in the Senate and the House. They are very much for um, these kinds of uh, business uh, incentives and business benefits, and I think they will conform. I, we don't know for sure, but that conformity bill is written, and I would, based on what I saw today, um, I was four hours down there, I would guess it would pass. Um, okay. David Johnson says he can talk now. Let's uh, uh, let's uh, free him up. Oh, he does. Where did it go? One second. Find him. Okay, there we go, David. Go right ahead and mute yourself. There we go, David. Yeah, can you all hear me? Sure. Now we can. We can hear you, David. Okay. All right. Yeah. Uh, on the issue of the. Uh, PPP loan and the uh, round two with the gross income. I looked that up for you. I was, I'm sorry, I was driving home or I would have looked it up sooner. Uh, but uh, that was changed in the interim final rule. Um, hold on a second and I will tell you exactly where uh, uh, that was changed on March the 3rd. And it's the interim final rule on page 32 that does base it on gross income. Uh, so uh, you can take it up to uh, $100,000 divided by 12 times 2.5. So it is based on gross income. Thank you. Thanks, David. So, so, so there you have your answer. Thank you so much, David. So for everybody, um, you're kind of wondering, what's, what's this random guy doing, you know, speaking up and giving us an answer? So David's one of our members of our Wealth Ability Network CPA group. And uh, David's a, a, a tax nerd like I am. So <laughs> David's, <laughs> that's not surprising. Thank you so much, David, for that. Um, really appreciate that. I was glad I'm, I turned out I wasn't stumped after all. I was right. So uh, there's your answer. Um, you know, you, you could have a net loss, but still get the loan um, and still use it for, um, for salary. So, and, and utilities, et cetera. So good, thank you, David. All right, who's next, Manny? We've got a few more minutes here. Sure, so Scott clarified his question. Uh, his question is about the second round of PPP loan qualification regarding 25% less on revenue versus net income for 2020 versus 2019. If net income is 25% less than 2019, 
do I qualify or does it have to be 25% less on revenue? So it's 25% less on revenue in any quarter of 2020 compared to 20, any, the same quarter for 2019. So let's say that your fourth quarter of 2020 was lower by 25% than your fourth quarter of 2019, but all of your others were higher in 2020. Doesn't matter, you still qualify. Okay, so just one quarter of 2020 compared to the same quarter of 2019, the gross revenue for that quarter has to be down by more by 25% or more. Okay, so thanks for clarifying that. Um, let's keep going, Manny. Uh, Manny. Sure, we have a, another question here. This one's interesting. With the assumption that many more individuals and companies are working from home, are the requirements for a home office still intact? Um, and are they being used exclusively and regularly? So the answer is yes, the requirements have not changed, which means you do not get them if you're an employee. You don't get a home office deduction if you're an employee. That changed in the 2017 tax law, okay? Only business owners and professional investors get to take a home office deduction. The, the rules for business owners and, and investors have not changed, okay? But they only apply to business owners and investors. They do not apply to employees. Um, now, there are rules for, is this your primary place of business? And what might have happened for some of you is that your primary place of business maybe used to be a different office, but now your primary place of business is your home office. And so it may be that for you, that's now your primary place of business. So you're gonna be able to qualify in 2020 and maybe 2021 where you did not qualify before because you had a different primary place of business. Good question, thank you. Sure, next next question, sure. The next question is from Chandra. She says she's investing in multifamily real estate through a self-directed IRA. And her question is, are these transactions subject to UBIT, unrelated business income tax, or UDFI? So UDFI is, is, um, is debt financed income, okay? And yes, it is subs if it's an IRA, then, so here's what happens. I will tell you, I'm going to be really upfront here. Not a fan of investing in real estate through an IRA for a whole host of reasons that I won't get into. I'm going to answer your specific question. We have what we call UDFI, which is unrelated debt financed income. So what that means is, is that let's say that you have 20% down. and 80% loan. Well, that means that 80% of your income is coming from the loan. It's debt financed income. And where this really comes into a, a play heavily in an IRA is, remember IRA normally isn't taxed. So you're not taxed on rents in an IRA as a general rule. Now you are if it's debt financed rental income. So if now you're not gonna get an 80% loan in an IRA anyway. So we're not even gonna look at that. We're gonna change that to 50 because that's probably the best you're gonna get is 50-50. That's one of the downsides to investing through an IRA. You don't get the same kind of leverage. But even 50%, 50% is debt financed income, right? So what happens is, let's say when you sell the property, let's say you had a $100,000 gain here. Well, of that 100,000, 50% applies to the debt and that 50% or $50,000 is taxable in the IRA. In the IRA. Um, so uh, yes, you're, you, uh, it's, you, are, you are subject to um, you, you're not really subject to unrelated business income tax. You're subject to the um, debt financed income tax. They're related, but it's really the debt financed. Um, let's take uh, one more question, Manny. 
Sure, this one comes from Sandra on Facebook. Is there any kind of relief for a gain on a sale of a rental property in 2020? The gain is only because the basis of the property was reduced in 2015 to exclude forgiveness, forgiveness of debt income at the time. But in reality, the property was sold at a loss, no economic relief whatsoever or yeah, benefit, sorry. Yeah, no. Well, you'd have an economic benefit. You, you, you reduced your loan, right? I mean, you did get an economic benefit. So you didn't pay as much in total, right? Because you reduced the loan. The answer is, the simple answer is no. There's no benefit. However, assuming you get some cash out of the deal, if you reinvest that cash, leverage it, your bank debt, your bonus depreciation on your new property could offset that gain. So don't ever think that there's only one way to skin this tax cap, right? There are many, many ways to look at this. So I would, if I were you, I'd definitely be sitting down with your tax advisor. Again, if you need help, come to wealthability.com, schedule a call, no charge for the call, just happy to help. We can find a way to help you. We will, we'll get you to a member um, like David Johnson, for example, he's one of our members, will get you to one of our members um, who is most suited for what you need and, and, and your level of complexity. Um, we, have, we have members who handle entry-level people who are you know, like contractors just starting out, and we have people who handle very sophisticated tax issues. So we have the full gamut. That's why we built the network, is so that we would have the full um, spectrum of advisors. Um, I want to thank everybody. I want to especially thank my team, um, um, uh, Manny, Amanda, Lauren, um, Diana, everybody else on the WealthAbility team. Uh, best thing about WealthAbility is we have the best team in the entire world. Um, it's an um, absolutely amazing team. Um, uh, Manny had to pitch in. This was last minute for him. He wasn't expecting to, to be the one in charge here. Um, it just worked out that way. One of our other members had some technical issues. So thank you, um, especially big thanks to Manny. Thank you all for joining us. Um, absolutely love doing these. And if, if, you, if, you, if you've enjoyed this, um, Manny, if you could put up the link for a um, review, um, Google review, if you put that link up, if you would please let people know that you enjoyed this. Um, if you're on Facebook, like us. Um, if you, um, uh, whether you're on Facebook or you're on Zoom, uh, Manny's going to put up that in the, in the chat box. He'll put up the, the link and go and give us a five-star review. We're trying to get more people to engage in this very important discussion about taxes and how the tax law really works. And I, I particularly appreciate those of you who are reading uh, this book, Tax Free Wealth, um, best book ever written on taxes. I'm just I'm kidding, but I'm not. Um, I actually have uh, one of my one of my who, somebody who's become a close friend um, actually told me that she thought it was a great beach read. Uh, so it's really easy. If you haven't read Tax Free Wealth, please go out and get it. It's really inexpensive. Um, you can get it at a bookstore. You can get it at Amazon. You can get it at Audible. Audible. You can get it at iBooks. I mean, it's everywhere. Um, um, it's, it's been very popular and I'm, I'm very grateful for that. Very grateful for you folks who, I mean, you're still here. It's an hour and a half and you're still here and, and you're engaged in building your own wealth and taking control of your wealth and not turning it over to some, somebody on Wall Street, okay? I just want to say congratulations and thank you so much for participating. Just remember, as we gain better financial knowledge and we get more um, uh, financial education like this and everything else we try to do at WealthAbility and through the entire Rich Dad group, which I'm very proud to be a part of, uh, what will always happen is you, you will always make way more money and pay way less tax. We'll see you next time.